a minute or two. morning. Welcome to Incarnation and welcome to all those on Zoom. It's lovely to have you worshipping with us as well. It's a beautiful, cool morning here under the canopies. And uh, for those of you who um, have got your BCPs, if you want to tear little bits off your song sheet or something and mark your psalm, which is going to be on page 282 at Psalm 15 today. And the collect is proper 17 and that's on page 619. So if you want to find those spots and mark them in your BCPs, that'll help you later. But uh, it's just lovely to have everybody with us here this morning. And we will be starting our worship on in the BCPs on page 123, 123. I'll just give you a moment to find those and then we will stand to worship. Morning Shanks, morning Galenuses, morning Montagues. Let's stand together. So we're on page one, two, three. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Let's pray for our hearts together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desire is known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Show me oh, what is good and what the Lord requires of me, but to do justly and to love mercy.
The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. We're praying the collect on page 619. O oh Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow after us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now is the moment when we pray for our children week by week. So if you can see a child near you, feel free to stretch out a hand towards them. Or if you're on Zoom and you can see one in a little box near you, uh, let's pray together for our children. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the children that you have given us in this community to shepherd and to watch over and to pray for. We thank you for the ways that school has got going this week and will get going next week. And we pray for those who are homeschooling, those who are in new classes, with new teachers, all the ways, Father, that they're stepping into this new school year. And so we ask for your blessing. Will you give them courage as they go into situations, perhaps, which make them feel unsettled or nervous? Will you give them delight in all that they are learning? Will you give them kindness for their peers and uh, patience with their teachers? And we ask all these things through Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, actually, and I should have prayed for the teachers as well. Heavenly Father, I just want to pray for the teachers. Strengthen them, encourage them, give them fresh hope for today. Amen. Now let's sing. Oh, actually, it's still the August song. I've got this A reading from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take away anything from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God, with which I am charging you. You have seen for yourselves what the Lord did with regard to the Baal of Peor, how the Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor, while those of you who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. See, just as the Lord my God has charged me, I now teach you statutes and ordinances for you to observe in the land that you are about to enter and occupy. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is? whenever we call to him. 
And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I am setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. The word of the Lord. Lord, who shall dwell in your tabernacle, or who shall rest upon your holy hill? Whoever leads an uncorrupt life and does that which is right and speaks the truth from his heart. He has not spoke he who has not spoken deceitfully with his tongue, nor done evil to his neighbor, and has not slandered his neighbor. In his eyes the wicked is rejected, and he makes much of those who fear the Lord. He swears to his neighbor and disappoints him not, though it were to his own hindrance. He has given given his money for you, and you too forgot against the innocent. Whoever does these things shall never be overthrown. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Oops, I think we're done. <laughs> Good job, we did it. A reading from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and you may live long in the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as you obey Christ, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. And masters, do the same to them, Stop threatening them, for you know that both of you have the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please all stand for the reading of the gospel? This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands thus observing the tradition of the elders, and they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, 
and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you may have had from me is Corbin, that is an offering to God, then you no longer permit anything, doing anything for a father or mother, thus making void the word of God through a tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like this. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside of a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. And when he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile? So it enters not the heart, but the stomach and goes out into the sewer. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of these evil things come from within and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise Lord Christ. I invite you to be seated. It is lovely to be with all of you after a long summer away. It is just so delightful to see all your faces, and I haven't had a chance to say that yet. Um, so for the kids that are here, this morning we're going to be talking about God's commandments and how they're meant for our flourishing, but how sometimes they're really hard to figure out exactly what God wants us to do. So I want you who are here among us to think about this question. We're going to be talking about God's commandment, the fifth commandment, for a little bit, which says, honor your father and mother. What does that mean? I'm just curious. If you were to write down a list or draw a picture of what honor your father and mother means, what would that mean? What would you do in order to honor your father and mother? And if you have brothers and sisters, I'd be curious after the service, if you compared your pictures, would you draw the same thing? Right? So what does honor your father and mother mean? And does it mean the same thing to everyone? I'm just curious. So we're going to talk a little bit about how it is that we understand God's commandments and how we figure out how they apply to our lives. And so one of those is honor your father and mother. So I want you to take some time this morning and maybe ask your parents what they think too. They have parents and they probably have expectations for what it means for you to honor them. And so maybe just have a little conversation with your family about what it means to honor your father and mother and how you think about what that means. So uh, as I alluded to, I had a chance this summer to spend a long time away. I'm really grateful. It was really good for me and my family. And uh, during my time away, I had a chance to finally begin chipping away at that stack of books and movies that I've had while I was in seminary that I just have like been piling up. A lot of it's like pop culture stuff that I just feel like people reference movies or books and I don't know what they're talking about. And so I've been trying to kind of become a little more culturally literate this summer. And so I've been uh, working through my stack little by little. And um, one of the movies, or it's actually a documentary that I read or that I watched this summer was a, a friend of mine or some friends of mine had recommended to me, which is a documentary called I Kissed, I Survived, I Kissed Dating Goodbye. Anyone seen this? Um, in it, this guy, Josh Harris, who some of you might know, he wrote this book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, in the year 1997. So I was at the tail end of high school. 
Um, but he wrote this book when he was 21 years old, right? And it was his sort of like vision of what dating and marriage should look like. And he got married shortly after he wrote this book. But in this book, he essentially suggests that courtship is the way to get married, right? So if you're on the path to marriage, courtship is the biblical way to do it. So if you look at the Old Testament writings on marriage and the New Testament writings on marriage, the way to implement those is courtship. And in it, he also goes one step further and he says that any form of physical intimacy at all violates the sacredness of marriage. And the reason I picked this movie up is because I wasn't directly impacted by this, but a lot of um, a lot of people that I grew up with, this was a book that was handed to them by youth group leaders. And so it was really influential in the circles that I grew up in. And I really wanted to understand um, the impact that this work has had and really the purity culture in general, what impact that that's had on people of my generation and the way they think about marriage and singleness and just human flourishing, right? And so when I was growing up, I can remember that there was a lot of kids in my youth group that had gotten this book from family members, from other youth leaders, from pastors, and they were reading through it, and they were wearing purity rings as a sign of their commitment to remain pure until they were married. They signed, there was a huge movement down on Capitol Hill where there was a true love waits, where people signed cards and committed to waiting um, until they were married, committing to be sexually pure until they were married. And thinking back, what this created was a sort of unspoken message in the air that was sort of all around me growing up, that if we remained sexually pure, then we would have a good relationship with God, right? So the order of things was, if you are pure, then God will accept you. And to boot, you'll attract a Christian spouse, right? So these are the order of things, right? So God accepts your purity, and in response, he gives you a great spouse. And for so many people that I grew up with, the means eclipsed the ends, right? If the goal of our striving is purity of heart so that we might see God, right? That is the goal of all of our striving is to see and experience union and the beauty of flourishing in the sight of God. But instead, the end became marriage, right? That was the that was the gold seal, the rubber stamp that I had, um, that I was right with God, right? But as deeply flawed, as I think most of us sitting here on the face of it recognize that this is, and as damaging as the purity movement has been for a lot of people, the one thing that struck me in this documentary, so it's the author going back and interviewing people about the impact that his book that he wrote when he was 21 has had upon them. The one thing that struck me walking away from watching this documentary was just how well-intentioned he was, right? He truly believed that he was reading scripture well and that he was truly pushing back a culture against a culture that said commitments not necessary sex can just be casual. And this was his honest response to wrestle with God's commands around marriage and sex. And it was his honest understanding and attempt to change the discourse and to help his fellow believers, right? He knew that the commands of God are intended for our flourishing. And he was just trying to work out what that meant for Christians today. And yet, as you watch this documentary, the thing that you realize is just how dangerous it can be when we suggest that our own practices have the same weight as God's commands, right? So courtship became on par with sexual purity within marriage, right? So he put those two, and so courtship was necessary in order to pursue marriage. And so the thing that became really dangerous about that is that if you put your practices, which are derived from scripture, on par with scripture itself, then you're not given any space to reevaluate or modify your practices or even to abandon them, right? To even go back and say, you know, I've talked to a lot of people. This just doesn't seem to be working out the way that I thought it would, right? So it just leaves you very little room to maneuver. 
And a lot of times what happens is that we're trying honestly to work out gaps in scripture. We're trying to figure out where scripture is silent. What does it mean? So in, for instance, there's been centuries of conversations in the church about what does it mean to keep the Sabbath holy? You'll find people who think that means you can't play games, you know, with your family out in the yard. You'll find people who say, it means I can have a great meal out at a restaurant with my friends. You'll have people who say, you can't go to have a restaurant meal because you're causing the workers to not be able to have their Sabbath, right? So even on something like that, what, what does it mean to keep the Sabbath holy works its way out in a whole host of different ways. And it's just really hard to take Old Testament commands and translate them centuries into the future and work out exactly what they mean. So this is a real honest struggle in the church. And today's gospel reading opens with the Pharisees questioning Jesus about why it is that his disciples don't follow the tradition that's been established among the elders of eating, of not eating with unwashed or defiled hands. Now to give a little bit of context for this, ritual impurity was a significant concern of Jewish life by this time. And so in the Old Testament, New Testament books, what you see is these regulations governing how Israel was to be holy, right, in their daily life, in order that they might approach God in a state of ritual purity. These regulations are precautions to be taken so that you don't defile other people, but they're also outlining steps that you can take to bring yourself back into right relationship with God if you've experienced impurity, right? And that's all in sort of that you can rejoin the community and you can re-enter the public worship of God. But as the, we can see in the case of our modern day public, modern day purity movement, the Old Testament doesn't cover every circumstance, right? It doesn't cover every little moment of your day. It gives you broad guidelines and then we need to work out what that means for you at your workplace or your interaction with your family. You have to work that out. We have to work that out. And so by the time of Jesus, when he's having this conversation with the Pharisees, what's arisen into the gap is the tradition of the elders. These are oral traditions that are meant to fill in those gaps, right? That are meant to take the Old Testament regulations around purity and meant to work out exactly what that means in every aspect of your life. And the Mishnah, which was where all these oral traditions were collected later, a few centuries after Jesus, they, when they're talking about these oral traditions, they describe them as a fence around the Torah, right? So what does it mean to be a fence? Well, it means that they uphold the law and they extend their implications into all of everyday life. But what happens when you get layers and layers of tradition that are a fence around the Torah, right? So you have the kernel in the middle and then you have all these layers of requirements on top of that. Well, what happens? is that over time you end up shifting the weight, right? So where does the weight fall? Tradition and our practices have a way of, of obscuring the kernel, right? Which is the law of God. We have this way of creating these layers of requirements what, about what it takes to fulfill the law. And actually we end up focusing on peripheral issues instead of core issues. And this is the heart of the disagreement between Jesus and the Pharisees. So the tradition has extended the Old Testament ritual purity requirements and established these complex hierarchies. And these practices aren't necessarily directly rooted in scriptural warrant, right? They have, you can draw the line, but you can't say this is required by scripture, right? You can, you can trace the line to how they got from a requirement to um, wash your hands for the priest and how that gets to the point where everyone's now required to wash their hands in order to cleanse themselves of defilement, but there's, it's not an explicit command, right? And so um, what we see is that Jesus isn't concerned here, and he's not angry because the Pharisees are concerned about purity. He's not like, purity doesn't matter. Don't be concerned about that. Don't be concerned about the laws, right? Where does he come down is he is concerned that they're observing human traditions. So these attempts to understand the law and to work it out have actually blinded them. And what, have it, what has it blinded them to? 
Well, it's blinded them to the fact that they're actually their traditions are causing them to reject God's commands or to undermine them. And they're also blind to their own undefiled heart, their own defiled hearts from which are flowing all these ideas and actions that are evil, right? So they're blind to these two things. And so turning away from the question of hand washing, Jesus says, just to be really clear, I'm going to give you another example of where you've taken the law and you've thought that you are maintaining a fence around the law, but you're actually going, you're going pretty far off track. And that's his case of Corbin, which was taking the command to honor father and mother, but instead saying, I'm going to honor God by giving my possessions I'm going to dedicate them to God. And what that meant is that that person could still have access to those possessions during their lifetime, but they could say to their parents, I can't help you because I've actually now dedicated these possessions to God. It would be sort of like me going to my tax accountant and being like, my parents have some really mounting health care bills. I don't really want to help them out. Can you help me create a shelter so I can still have access to my funds and eventually I'll give them to the church, right? So that's a good thing. I'll give them to the church, but I'm not going to help my parents out with them right now. So I think we would immediately recognize the hypocrisy of that, right? You're using one command of honoring God to undermine the other command, which is to honor your parents. And in the case I sketched out earlier, it made me think how much our modern purity culture has actually served to undercut God's teachings on sex and marriage. And then that made me take one step further back and say, are there other church practices, right, that maybe you grew up with or that you witness here or in the wider church? Are there other practices that risk putting our own traditions and our own attempts to understand scripture over and above the commands? Or places where we've said that this practice is necessary but if you actually start unpacking it, it actually undermines the command that we're attempting to explain and follow so closely. As you're thinking about that, one of the things I want to remind you of is that even in this passage, Mark is alluding to a debate in the church that took a long time to work out. And that was the question of eating unclean foods. Or as the question is posed by, to Paul by the Corinthian church, are Christians permitted to eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols? So lest we think that these are easy questions to work out, lest we think that it is easy to figure out exactly what the commands of God mean, look at the early church and look how long it took them to work out the question of what it meant to be Gentile believers. You know, was it all right to eat food that had already been sacrificed to idols? I think when it comes to these hard questions of how scripture works out, we need to first bring to it a deep knowledge of scripture, right? So when Jesus is explaining to the Pharisees about how they have gone so far astray, he doesn't point just to the Ten Commandments, right? He pulls in the teachings from Isaiah. He has this broad knowledge of Scripture and how it fits together in this beautiful picture to reveal God to us. And so I think, first of all, when we're wrestling with these questions of how to interpret Scripture rightly, we have to know Scripture. We have to be steeped in it. But also I think it really helps to have a deep understanding about how the church has wrestled with these questions in the past. I think one of the things that made me so sad listening to Josh Harris's attempt to work out the implications of his book was just how shallow his knowledge of the church was, right? He looked around his local church community and he thought that was enough to write a book on marriage and sex. He didn't turn to Christians in other parts of the world who are grappling with these same questions. 
He didn't turn to read what other Christians in the past had written about these questions. He thought it was enough to just look inward, just him and the Bible. But the truth is that we have so many more resources at our disposal for understanding how the commandments of God work out than just us and the Bible. And in fact, the Bible was never meant to be worked out by ourselves anyhow. And we acknowledge that every Sunday when we're here and when we meet for small groups like our first Corinthian groups to really wrestle with that book, right? We come together in places like this so that we can hear scripture and work out what it means. Bringing each of our diverse perspectives and backgrounds our own histories, maybe our experiences in other Christian traditions. We bring all of that, all of that beauty to the table when we're working through what scripture means and how the commands of God are to be worked out. And I want to say this. The other thing that struck me when I was watching this documentary is just how hard it is to question practices when they're deeply rooted in a community and when they're supported by authority figures in the church. Right? It's really hard to question the content of a book when you're 16 when it's being given to you by your youth pastor or your parents. And that made me wonder where we have spaces in the church to bring our own questionings and wonderings and wrestlings. Where do we create spaces to be humble enough to have our deeply held practices questioned? Doesn't mean that we'll jettison them at the end of the day, but it does mean that we're gonna wrestle with them and be open to hearing other perspectives. And here's a question for you. Do you have places? Do you, do each of you have places where you feel like you can ask these questions and wrestle openly? I want to close with Jesus's pointed remarks on our heart, which is how he closes the passage, which is a great way to make it stick with you, right? It's the last thing you read. Is Jesus' remarks on our hearts. I'm going to read from the message translation. So when he gets to the room just with his disciples, which in Mark is kind of code for, here's, here's the, here I'm going to tell you what it really means, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to unpack that parable I just told. So the closest passage, Jesus is with his disciples in a room, and he says this in response to the question, what does it mean to say that the things that you consume don't defile you? Don't you see that what you swallow, what you eat, can't contaminate you? It doesn't enter into your heart, but it goes through your stomach, works its way out through your intestines, and it's finally flushed away. It's what comes out of you that pollutes you. And those are obscenities, lust, theft, murder, Adultery, greed, depravity, deceptive dealings, carousing, mean looks, slander, arrogance, foolishness. All these things are what is, are vomited out of your heart. They're vomited out of your heart. And that is what pollutes you. I will note that sexual issues are embedded within a whole host of other things that I think we're really quick to gloss over. So I just want to point out that it's all a muddle of things that proceed out of us. But what Jesus is saying is that our external actions flow from our internal motives and desires. Right? So when we're working through scripture, what are our motivations? You know, is it the really great marriage that I'll be promised because I've remain pure, right? Or is my desire to see God, 
to know his holiness in my life, to be united with him more and more every day. Because without the presence of Christ within us, without his presence that renovates our hearts, any attempts that we make to maintain our physical purity are only going to mask, they're only going to paper over our impure hearts. And we're going to risk confusing our means in the end. We're going to substitute our pure bodies for our impure hearts and risk union with God. Our observances and practices should always lead us towards God and to the love of others. And if they ever do otherwise, if you ever find yourself questioning where a practice is leading you, then it's time to check your motivation and the practice itself. The challenge to us as Christians, to the ones in whom the Spirit of God abides, is to sort out just what difference the resurrection of Christ makes for our practices and how we're to remain loyal to the commandments of God. And so I pray that the Lord God would have mercy upon us all as we work towards purity of our hearts. Amen. From the depths of woe I raise to thee the voice of lamentation. Lord, turn a gracious ear to me and hear my supplication. If thou iniquities dost mark our secret sins and misdeeds dark, oh, who shall stand? before thee oh who shall stand before thee to wash away the crimson stain Grace, grace alone availeth. Our works, alas, are all in vain. In much the best life faileth. No man can glory in thy sight. All must alike confess thy might and live alone by mercy. And live alone by mercy. Therefore my trust is in the Lord, and not in mine own merit. On him my soul shall rest his word, upholds my fainting spirit his promised mercy is my fort my comfort and my sweet support i wait for it with patience i wait for it with patience
But though I wait the live long night until the dawn appeareth, my heart still trusteth in his might, it doubteth not nor feareth. Do thus, so ye of Israel see. Ye of the Spirit born indeed, and way till God appeareth. And way till God appeareth. Though great our sins and sore our woes, His grace much more abounded. His helping love no limit knows, Our utmost need it sounded. Our shepherd good and true is He, Who will the last this Israel free From all their sin and sorrow from all their sin and sorrow We're on page 127, 127. Let us together confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we pray. Our response uh, this morning will be slightly different. I will say, O oh Lord, hear our prayer, and you will respond, Come quickly, Prince of Peace. Let us pray for the church and for the world. We pray for Afghan people who feel abandoned and vulnerable today. We ask you to draw near and protect them from every kind of harm. We grieve and pray for the families of the more than 160 whose lives were lost in an attack, and for the many more who were maimed or injured, who were simply seeking a better and safer life. We pray for the families of the 13 American service women and men whose lives were lost in the mission to provide safe passage to strangers. We also pray against spiritual emptiness and against counterfeit religion that values destruction and desolation in heaven's name. 
Jesus, you will one day have the worship of all the peoples of the earth. With your faithful people in every age and in every place, we add our voices. O Lord, hear our prayer. Come quickly, Prince of Peace. We thank you for the opportunity we at Incarnation have to furnish a home for a refugee family next month on September 11. Make us generous and give us creativity in this very tangible way of loving our neighbors as ourselves. If it is your pleasure, Lord, we ask that we might not only prepare such a place, but we'll have a chance to truly welcome this family and many others in Jesus' name. We pray for those in the path of Hurricane Ida. In your mercy, spare lives and keep rescue and relief workers safe. We pray for Arlington schools, which open this week, health and safety for children and teachers, as well as kindness and patience among parents, a spirit of wisdom and humility for administrators and leaders. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Come quickly, Prince of Peace. We also pray for Guinea-Bissau, our country of the week on the west coast of Central Africa, a country that is troubled by human trafficking, drug trafficking, rising COVID rates, and political unrest. Uphold freedom of religion and restrain religious radicalism. We pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in Guinea-Bissau that they may use their freedom of worship to love their neighbors across ethnic and religious lines, and that you, Lord of the harvest, would send more gospel workers into your harvest fields. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Come quickly, Prince of Peace. For the leadership of our diocese and our pastors, Liz, Katie, Amy, for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, we pray particularly for the ministry of our deacons, David Griffin and Quatley Olivieri. We thank you that David has been approved for ordination on October 17th. We give thanks that you, provide, you continue to provide laborers in this, your harvest field, and shepherds for your flock. We also pray that you will call those who will serve on Incarnation's Vestry. Give your church wisdom as we consider and vote later this fall. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Come quickly, Prince of Peace. For our nation, for those in authority, and in, for all in public service, including our president, governor, judges, and law enforcement officers, May they govern justly yet humbly, knowing that you are the judge of all who will hold them to account. We pray that we, your church, who in Christ have been adopted as your children, that we would be peacemakers in our nation, in our community, and in our families. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Come quickly, Prince of Peace. We also pray for those in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, we particularly pray for Nathan Foran, Ginny, and Katie's brother, who is hospitalized with COVID. We pray that even though he is in isolation, that he would know you as his good shepherd who is with him. We pray that you will heal his body and restore his strength, and that you would be present to his wife, Becca, and their children in this anxious time. Thank you that Katie and Jenny have been able to travel to be with them and support them. We also pray for those that you would meet the needs uh, of all those whom we name aloud or silently in our thoughts. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Come quickly, Prince of Peace. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus' sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Lord, 
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I invite you to stand if you are able to, or if you're on Zoom, just, uh, I don't know, keep sitting. Um, but the peace of the Lord be always with you. Um, take a moment to greet people around you with the peace and uh, wave to those uh, on Zoom as well. There you go. Once you've said peace to a few people, take your seats again and just going to give you a few announcements. It's lovely seeing you all here. This is always a moment where everyone kind of goes, can we just stop now? I need to catch up with all these lovely people. My name's Liz and I'm one of the pastors here and I'm again just very grateful to see you all here. It's lovely to be worshipping together. There's a summary of the announcements on your um, song sheet, and it's also on your, those of you on Zoom, it's in the middle of your um, liturgy, so you can have a little look there, but just a few reminders. So first of all, sign up for small groups is opening today. So we're going to be having four small groups this trimester, and I would encourage you, as Katie said, we need to be in places where we can wrestle together with each other. So the four small groups, there's going to be two, which are going to be essentially following up on the sermon week by week. There's going to be one, which is about how do we have spiritual conversations? What are those skills that we can learn that can take a conversation to a deeper level? Um, and then the fourth one is, um, is kind of essentially basics of faith, but looking at the creeds in particular. So if you're fairly new to Anglicanism or new to faith, that might be an interesting one for you to go to. A good place to just get to grips with the basics of what we believe and why. So have a look. There's all the information's online. So just go to the website and you can see there where they are. So next Sunday, September the 5th, first Sunday in the month. And so therefore it is Donut Sunday. So I encourage you all to bring um, something to share and we will linger after the service to uh, just eat donuts and do brunchy things together. While that is happening, a few other things will be happening as well. First of all, there will be a, a very brief, Grant promises me like a 10-minute choir rehearsal. So if you're in the choir, you can do a little tune-up in the chapel. If you are a child and you are interested in being part of our volunteer team, that includes reading and serving communion and stuff like that, ushering, then there's going to be a training for you guys after the service. So we will let you have some donut time, a little bit of donut time. You can bring your donut to the training. Uh, and then there'll be just um, Josie and Katie are going to be leading a, a, that for a little while. So some people can sing, some people can train to be a volunteer. And actually, if you're an adult and you want to listen in on that kid's training because you qu can't quite remember how to do things, that's fine too. I'm sure that they'll accommodate any, any size volunteers next week. Then a couple of upcoming dates. Um, on September the 19th is the next time when we're going to be welcoming members. So I've had a number of conversations with people already, but if you would like to consider becoming a member and you haven't yet talked to me about that, let's do that soon. Um, so give me a shout and we will have coffee, lunch, dinner, tea, something, and talk about um, what it means to be a member at Incarnation. And then uh, it was mentioned earlier, we prayed for David being confirmed... Uh, not confirmed, ordained on October the 17th. 
the bishop comes to do that ordination and uh, he is also willing and interested to do confirmations that Sunday. So if you have not been confirmed and would like to be, let me know because we do need to take you through a little brief course. So you can't decide on October the 16th that you want to be confirmed on the 17th. But if you decide now, then I would love to help you get ready for that and um, be confirmed on the 17th. Now, I don't know if any of you have been thinking this week, have you seen God's goodness at work around you this week? Or have you been an agent of God's goodness this week? Anyone want to just come and share a brief testimony? Weber is leaping to his feet. Come on, Weber, come and give us a testimony. Well, on my current work schedule, I am teleworking four days a week, and I come into the office on Tuesdays. So early on Tuesday morning of this past week, I uh, summoned a lift to my office, and I rode with, um, with an Afghan-American driver. Uh, because it's just being broadcast, it might be discreet for me not to say his name, uh, but uh, it is a name which begins with the letter A. So my driver A, quote unquote, was this Afghan American who, as it turned out, uh, had been in this country for some time, maybe approximately a decade, but had worked as an interpreter with our, uh, with our American forces and the British in his country. And he said, I'm not enjoying my life right now because... I'm trying to get my family out. So I told A that we would pray. We are certainly, of course, praying for the whole um, for the whole situation. But God has this wonderful ability to take, unlike us, He can take in the whole situation all at once. But He can also look at each person in the situation as if he or she were the only one. So in that spirit, I would invite us, if we think of it, during the week, uh, not just to pray, and you might have other people that you know, that you have encountered in the same way. I think what God is encouraging us to do is as much as possible to put names and faces um, on these prayers because it helps us. Uh, God who kn knows who they are, but it helps us to pray in line with the Spirit. So please pray for A, that his family would be delivered along with so many others. Thank you. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for A. And I thank you for Weber and his willingness and obedience to your call to speak out truth and to just be curious about people and invite them into conversation. Lord, we pray for A as he tries to get his family out. Will you um, guard and protect his wife and children? Will you give them a route to safety? Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. Anybody else? Look out, there's a, going to be a blog coming from Weber this week as well with um, another story of another Uber or Lyft driver. He is a prolific conversationist, and we're grateful for you, Weber. Grant prayed in faith for um, the, this apartment we're going to set up. We haven't actually been promised one yet, but we've asked for one, so do keep praying for that as well. We would love to be able to furnish an apartment for a family coming um, as refugees into this country. The other thing we're doing, and I hope you... Perhaps you noticed this, you possibly forgot, but um, we have a little basket up here. If you brought gift cards, I mentioned it in my letters from Liz this week. If you've got gift cards, when you come up for communion, just feel free to pop them in that little basket and then they will be delivered to um, the people who are distributing them tomorrow. And we'll also do, I've already had at least one person say to me, oh, I forgot. So we will do it again next week as well. So feel free to um, bring gift cards next week too. There are lots of ways that we can serve our neighbors and just praying for opportunities and, and Val, you know, encourage you to be on the alert. Um, every second day, Weber has met an Afghan refugee or someone from uh, a different country 
this week, and I encourage all of us to be on the lookout for people we can serve and love around us. And now as we do come to the table, there's an opportunity to give um, by texting and all the other clever things that happen. Um, but also I invite you now as we sing to prepare your heart to come and to take the bread and the wine. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love, and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory sin's curse has a loss its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of christ in me from life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it right, is right, right to, to give, give him thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. It is right and our joy always and our duty always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and 
and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Please be seated. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended into to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. 
Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. This table is open to all who are baptized and following Jesus, and we'll have two stations available and encourage you to come forward as the ushers guide you or as you're so led. And if you're wanting to receive communion, just put out your hands and we will dip and give you a wafer. If you want to just simply be prayed for, cross your arms. And if you want to stay where you are, if you want to receive communion and stay where you are, just wave or tell an usher. Or otherwise, if you just want to sit and be quiet, then of course, that's absolutely wonderful as well. I'm going to invite those who are serving communion with me in a minute to come up and get themselves ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand when darkness seems to hide his face i rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand His oath, His covenant, and His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand.
When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Please stand. Let us pray the post-communion thanksgiving prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. And just before I do the blessing, I want to, us to pray over the computer. Bob and Melinda, it's their, um, probably their last Sunday with us. They're about to move to Georgia, which is and. They have very much been founding members of Incarnation, and so they're going to be hugely missed. Um, and we'd sort of hoped that they'd be able to come this morning, but for various reasons they couldn't. So just picture Bob and Melinda in your mind. And um, Father, we thank you. We thank you for Bob. Thank you for Melinda. Thank you for their faithful service at Incarnation and in your church globally. We thank you, Lord, for the ways that they love and serve you. And we pray that you will watch over them as they move down to St. Simon? Will you keep them safe? Will you quickly embed them in a new community of faith? Will you help them to find good neighbours and people who they can reach out to in the way that they uniquely do? And we ask that you will bless them and keep them. Amen. Wish we could physically hug you today, Bob and Melinda. And now, the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Lovely to see you all. Do feel free to linger and chat and look forward to seeing you next week as well. Oh, oh yes, and there's prayer at the back. Mustn't forget there's a team who will be waiting